right, we're all set for the next file. We're hearing HMA 22349 for 10 Franklin Avenue in Hamilton. We have the agents registered to speak and no other interested parties. Okay, is the agent available? Hi, yes, uh, my name is Natalia Tenko Brothers and Associates. I'm the agent on file. Yeah, did you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? We have and we have no further comments and I can answer any questions at this time. Okay, does the committee have any questions? Move it. Moved by Nancy. Uh, Mel. Oh, moved by Mel, seconded by Nancy. Second. All in favor? Here, here. Opposed? Seeing none. Motion carried, application approved. Wonderful, thank you.
Okay, Mr. Chair, I believe we are all set to proceed and return from recess. Did you want to do roll call or did you want to proceed? Sorry. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to confirm. Mark, are you still there? I sure am. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, roll call is not necessary. Everyone's visible. All right, we are all set for the next item then. We are hearing HMA 22268 for 100 Charlton Avenue West in Hamilton. We have the agent registered to speak. And I believe we have interested parties as well. Yes, we have interested parties as well, Mr. Chair. Okay, is the agent available? Yeah. All right, if the agent can come forward to the lectern. Be appreciated, thank you. Did you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Yes, we've had an opportunity to review the staff report, and if I may, I do have some brief comments. Okay. Uh, if I may begin, I'll just make some quick introductions. My name is James Webb. I'm a professional land use planner that's speaking to you today on behalf of the owners. Um, Mr. Jordan and Eugene Fortino are also here. They're the uh, new owners of the subject property and they can assist me if any questions <laughs> arise with regards to the role in the property. Um, the narrative of this matter that's before you today is, is the new owners are effectively making a reinvestment in this property. It's, it's a beautiful old building that's been in that Duran neighborhood for a significant period of time. Um, it requires significant updating. It has old infrastructure. It has the... Um, mechanical systems that do need significant upgrades. And um, for these owners to basically ensure that this building, which is, um, has great quality and character, is, is retained and, and not um, fall into any disrepair, they need to spend significant monies. And to do so, um, they need to um, move forward and effectively reinvest in this property. And in doing so, and in looking at the floor place, um, that building today only has nine dwelling units, three in the basement and two on each floor and above, and they're quite large. Um, through a review undertaken by an architect, it's been confirmed that we can do a moderate increase of only six units and take the total in the building up to 15 units in total. Um, still very generous in size. Um, but those units, like the other units in the building, do not have the benefit of on-site parking. So for us to seek an incremental approval of, of those six units, we need to come before the committee and seek the variances that are before you today, which is to request that there, no additional parking be required for those units, as none exists today for the other units, and some additional what I'll call technical variances. <coughs> Um, it is my submission to you that uh, there are no adverse impacts that arise from this development. And I make that point predominantly on, you know, how the building really will continue to function. Uh, keep in mind that everything that's happening is within that existing building. So first principles, we're retaining the shell and making significant reinvestment in that. Today, there are, I believe, 22 bedrooms in that unit dispersed among those, uh, that number of existing units. With the reconfiguration, we're looking at effectively the same number of bedrooms, but in a larger number of units. So instead of a range of three bedroom units, we'll be having one bedroom and two units. But at the end of the day, effectively, it's the same number of people living in the building, which tells me that there's really not gonna be any incremental adverse impact in terms of traffic, offsite parking issues, or any other nuisance impacts. And certainly by preserving the shell, there's no visual impacts to the neighborhood in terms of overshadow, overlook, or privacy impacts. So with that, Mr. Chairman, those are my submissions. I'd be pleased to assist the committee with any questions. I was just gonna suggest that, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. If you can sit down and we'll call the interested parties in the order that their registration was received. Uh, so we have Susan MacArthur registered to speak. If you could please come forward to the lecture and to pretend, present your comments.
Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Susan MacArthur. I am a tenant. I'll try, but this is the best I can do. <laughs> My name is Susan MacArthur. I am a tenant at 100 Charlton Avenue West. I'm also ha here on behalf of the ACORN group, who has <clears throat> offered a submission. They are a tenants rights organization who supports the tenants at 100 Charlton Avenue in order to let them stay in their homes. So we are writing to the Committee of Adjustment regarding the Fortino Properties request for parking variances for the purpose of so as to permit six additional units within the existing building envelope of a multiple dwelling. ACORN supports the request of 100 Charlton tenants for the committee to deny the application. 100 Charlton Avenue West is currently made up of nine units with 19 tenants. There are six three-bedroom units in the building, providing important family-friendly units in the downtown neighborhood. The landlord has shared with the tenant in the building that their plans to achieve six additional units is by converting the three bedroom units into smaller one and two bedroom units. This would result in the demo eviction of all units, all individuals, pardon me, and families that call these three bedroom units home. Hamilton is in a housing crisis and we urge the committee to factor the cost of tenant displacement into evaluating this application. Not only will tenants be displaced, but the plans will result in the loss of family friendly housing, and ACORN urges the community and the committee to deny the request for the parking variance. The city must do everything in its power to protect the tenants in Hamilton's affordable housing stock. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Okay, we will next hear from Nicole Lamb. I believe they are calling in, uh, sorry, via the WebEx. Hi there. <clears throat> um, my name is Nicole Lamb. Uh, good afternoon, Committee of Adjustment. I live at 100 Charlton Avenue West, Apartment 3. Uh, after listening to the cases presented to you this afternoon, I am now realizing that you probably want me to speak in a very short period of time, and I'll be as relevant in my stance as humanly possible. So this entire time, I've been trying to reword my request to you so that you can deny the variances one to three and zoning references that were stated in this application for proposed single detached dwelling. If you knew me, being a mother of two, a medical secretary who works for the chief of cardiology at St. Joe's, a salsa dance teacher who communicates how to move their body, being a writer at heart and to have lived here since 2012, it's not easy for me to not spill all the details of what's really going on here. This could take too much of your time. So I will be, be brief. I do find this request arrogant and point out that the owners are parking the cart before the horse and seem to be quite confident in this political environment to get these variances approved before handing out notices to their tenants. It is sad that not only people who reside around us know more about what our owners intentions are than we do, but they're using your resources, resources to notify us of such possible changes. That aside, and trying to stage the point, I ask that you focus on the purpose of this variance application and consider. When they first owned the building in 2019, they already were pressuring us to move out and they also started renovating. And so they didn't displace people. They disrupted people without notice. They have lied to us. They haven't followed through with their word. And I need you to consider that for this tenant displacement, five tenants already have been displaced due to the pressure of the move out uh, since 2019 and have to face the average rent of $1,600 per one bedroom unit. I make la less than that in two weeks. Number two, the impact of three bedroom apartments for rent. There are becoming less and less units for families and this includes families that need to make room for their aging mother or father to move in. And if we can't do this, the wait list for healthcare system is affected as well. And confinement leads to anxiety, anger, and early transmission of infection, or easy, I should say, transmission of infection. Number three, the impact. Oh, of 
the, I have one last one. The impact of parking space that have been mentioned in the application comments, which are against this variance. Charlton and Bay has limited parking, which only leaves parking wars on Robinson Park and surrounding side streets. The landlord not only wants us to have parking, not have parking spots, but the people who come to visit us. So I, I reiterate, please deny this variance application. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Michael Schemi. I believe they are in person. You could please proceed to the, le the lectern. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Shime. I live at 100 Charlton Avenue West, Unit 6. Um, I wrote a bunch down, but I'm actually going to kind of wave that. Uh, I think I'm just going to stick to the simple fact that <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. This is I went to school with two of the guys up there, so this is a little bit weirder for me. So I think this is. Uh, I'm trying to find the best words. All I have to say is that they want to upgrade the building. There is uh, proof that they did that without having to eject the entire building. They've already done that in one of their units on the first floor, one of the big units. There's zero mention in the agent's <laughs> impact on the people that live there, and I think that's it's just put me over the edge, so I'm going to remain calm and say, please, listen to Hamilton talking to you because we are the people that live there and need, need to stay in our homes. We don't have anywhere else to go. There's been no plan, there's no regard, there's no heads up. We got a notice on the door and as a result of that, we're gonna be kicked to the curb. So just listen to the, the city speaking to you. That's all I gotta say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll now hear from Jonathan Nichols. If you could please proceed to the lecture. Good afternoon, thank you for allowing me to speak to you. Um, I live at 90 Charlton Avenue, uh, which is a 73 unit apartment building next door to 100. And I'm a member of the board there and the treasurer. <clears throat> Our concern is not um, with uh, the number of units. Our concern is with the lack of parking. We have a uh, visitor's parking lot, which is just adjacent to 100. And we have a lot of problem with people parking in that parking lot who are not visitors to our unit, such that we have to pay a reasonably substantial amount of money every month to have it monitored. And we had to do this because so many infringements were taking place that we could, that our visitors could not park there because people were parking there with, who are not visitors. <clears throat> we anticipate that there, there is a very great lack of parking in the area, as we all know. And increasing the number of units will inevitably increase the, the requirement for parking both for residents and visitors. To say that it's the same number of bedrooms, I think, is a completely irrelevant argument because presumably some of the uh, additional bedrooms are occupied by members of the same family, perhaps even children. I don't have knowledge of that. But if we're making a larger number of units, that means there'll be a larger number of people who will be potentially needing parking spaces and a larger number of people who will have visitors who will potentially need parking spaces. And to increase the density of residences in this area 
without making sufficient allowing for parking, allowance for parking, just seems to me totally irresponsible. So that's my point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. We'll now hear from Maha Asaf. Oh. <coughs> you don't wish to speak? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who is here to speak on behalf of this application or for this application? <laughs> nope, seeing none. Okay, to the committee. Questions? Thomas? Thomas? Yes, I'd just like to clarify, uh, is it 15 units now? Or is it 15 units after you add the six? Sorry, is that to the uh, agent? Sorry, if you could come back to the lecture. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, the, the existing number is today is nine. Sorry? The existing t number is nine, and we're increasing it by six units to a total of 15. So you're going, it's right now it's nine. Yes. Nine, nine larger units and we're going to 16, obviously, smaller units. Uh, thank you. Okay. Nancy? Let's come back. Please. Might as well stay there. Yeah. I just have a concern that what I'm hearing is there's been no communication with the residents of the building. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, through you again, through you, Mr. Chairman. So there, there's already been a turnover, I believe, of four units. So for newer tenants who I believe um, are known to the owners and were advised to this. But I think the owners, the hesitation, and again, secondhand from information, the hesitation was to go forward with the, the dialogue about this because of the uncertainty. There's no point um, having those discussions unless there's certainty that they can, in fact, proceed with what they'd want to do. So their intent was to await the decision of the Committee of Adjustment, which admittedly is a public process and brings people into the conversation. But their plan is to have the for full and proper dialogue with those remaining residents in the building you know, once this matter is determined. Can they in fact proceed? Because they have a significant amount of work still to do. They have to engage with the architect to actually produce working drawings, um, tender the project. So, you know, we're talking about something that's not going to happen for a significant period of time, six to eight months from now, which enables um, plenty of time for further dialogue. And, and obviously the, the owners of the building are, are required to uphold um, you know, all aspects of the Landlord Tenant Act in terms of their responsibilities to those existing tenants. So um, maybe a bit out of sequence in terms of those steps, but you know, there is their full commitment to work with the existing residents. Okay. Um, we've heard a number of times throughout the past, I don't know, uh, maybe Ms. Armstrong there will call, but a number of times where tenants have been put out and nowhere to go because we know the rising cost of units today is like, it's just un unaffordable for most people. Um, is there an opportunity to have those discussions with these people before a decision's made? They need to know where they're going to be in six months. They need yeah. to know if they're no longer going to have three bedrooms and maybe only two. Uh, for someone who mentioned having two children, they're going to be downsized and out the door with nowhere to go. So I guess I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to make that, um, what do we call it, town hall meeting? Yeah, yeah. Um, through Mr. Chairman, I mean, the, the owners are here. They, they want it to be in attendance. They obviously to hear the commentary. So I think they will be taking this as a very strong message for them to um, dialogue with those ex existing residents, provide them certainty on the timelines. And, and talk to them about um, how they can assist them and manage them um, through that transition process. Okay, Margaret. Yes, I just want to, just a comment. Um, I'm a little torn uh, with this application because we know that there's um, a need for uh, additional residential units. On the other hand, we also know that there's a need for the larger family units as well. So cutting down some of these larger units, which could accommodate families, um, I'm not sure whether that is necessarily the right way to go, considering um, how, so, how few of uh, three-bedroom units or even two-bedroom units there are. Um, so it's just a comment that I'm a little torn with this application. Thomas? Uh, I, I, I take it once these renovations are done, the rents are going up. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, my understanding would be, yes, in order, I mean, there's a significant I, capital outlay 
that is required to cover the cost of, of all the infrastructure replacement. There has been Band-Aid work done to date, but we're talking about made replacement of an old water um, heating and cooling system, et cetera. I'd be surprised if they didn't go up. Uh, my, my thought is this. This building is an anomaly, obviously. There, you can't build a building like this today and not have any parking, zero parking. Uh, it's, it's, it then what comes to mind is it's a non-conforming use. Uh, generally, the law is you can't expand a non-conforming use for, for reasons that... Unless you get a variance. Sorry? Unless you get a variance, you can't. Yes, yes. So the question is, do we want to give a variance to expand a non-conforming use that would cause, I, from the what we heard here uh, and from the letters that we've received, additional parking problems in an area where parking is now a problem? And I drove around that area. There's, there's very, very little street parking available. Uh, and... and uh, Generally, that means people are going to park next door where there's this nice big lot, even though they're not supposed to be parking there. Uh, I'm inclined to to disagree that uh, there, there are, I think the statement was no adverse effects. I think there are adverse effects. We've heard of some of them. With the tenants, there's not much we can do about that. I mean, if. If, if they didn't need a variance, they could go ahead and do the renovations and these tenants would have to leave and there's nothing anybody could do about it. The, the, the only uh, issue here is that because they're, they're seeking a variance, we have, we have a say in, in, in the way it goes. And it seems to me that there is some merit in the complaints of the neighbors. Uh, the, uh, on Bay Street, I had a look just on the way down today even, there's only three hour parking on Bay Street next to that building and, and down the block and no parking overnight. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a problem now and it will become a bigger problem, seems to me, if you expand the units, even six units. Uh, six units could be zero cars, I suppose, but it's not likely. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm inclined, I mean, the only benefit coming out of all of this, I think, is, is the, for the landlord. And, you know, everybody wants to make more money, but the question is, at what price? And uh, in, in this case, I, I'm satisfied from the submissions that the, the neighbor is going to pay a price. And okay. the people that have to park there now are going to pay a price. And I'm inclined to vote against the... Okay, Nancy? Yes, if you don't mind. Um, I have to disagree with my colleague. I've said it before, people have me on record as saying, when you choose to rent a unit, you know in advance whether it provides parking. If you choose to park illegally on another property, then you will pay a price, whether it be through bylaw or their condominium security or whoever it is. So I don't want to support an argument that says you can't have no parking because there's already nine units in there that have no parking. Am I correct on that? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Okay. So when I come and rent the, part, the apartment in six months' time and they say the unit comes with no parking, that's my choice to accept it or not accept it. So we have three variances in front of us. Each one of them are pertaining to parking, loading zones, and visitor parking. There hasn't been visitor parking to date. There are no parking spots for the original line and there are zero loading spots at this moment as well. So based on these three, not the issues that are upsetting the neighbors, but the parking variances alone, I would support a motion. David? Um, I would have to agree with my colleague here. Um, I think we're in much needed need of units, intensification downtown, and what we're doing is we're adding more units. So I'll make a motion for approval. Okay, motion on the floor for approval, seconded by Nancy. All in favor of the motion? Here, here. Opposed? I have two opposed, Mr. Chair. Motion carried, application approved. Okay, 
and we're all set for the next file. So we're hearing HMA 22361 for 400 King Street East in Hamilton. We have the agent registered to speak and a number of interested parties, Mr. Chair. Roll of that. Thank you. Maybe just uh, wait a moment and yep. okay. uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, James Webb speaking to you today on behalf of Core Urban Inc. Um, additional introduction that I also have in attendance with me today in the event that there's any questions that they can assist with, uh, Mr. Steve Kulikowski and Mr. Dave Sofe, the principals of, of Core Urban, who will, will be well known to this committee because they have, I think, single-handedly built some of the most um, beautiful, iconic restoration projects in the downtown and are involved in this project that's before you today as, as effectively the, the builders, and, and the interim owners who are assisting in, in a project that, in my humble opinion, is much needed in the downtown, and the end result of this project is, is quite favorable for an existing um, social population that's going to benefit from a new location within the downtown. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to drive past the building in the last period of time, but you will have immediately seen the touch of Core Urban and that they've stripped off um, some haphazard, in, inappropriate <laughs> attempts to make it look nice. I guess the lipsticks come off and what's underneath is another beautiful heritage building that is really the signature of what Corbin has done throughout the downtown. Um, I, I think that um, the matter before you today does benefit from a bit of background and explanation. So um, this property will benefit uh, mission services who are currently downtown and are relocating to this property. And there's two very distinct phases to the project. If you've been passed, you've seen that, that work is underway today. There are building permits that have been issued to facilitate the adaptive reuse of that existing building for a lodging house, which is a permitted use. Unquestionably, there, there's no issue with respect to that and the building permit was issued without the need for any modifications whatsoever to the current zoning bylaw. The second phase of development enables additional space for these residents, 36 in total, to be accommodated on the site. And it's deemed um, desirable by mission services to allow for this because what it's giving them is the ability to now offer on this site a very unique form of social assistance in that um, they have um, transitory um, spaces within the, in this building that are, I'll say, a step above just standard um, general shared accommodations wherein people will have effectively their own space, a door that locks, an ability to leave space. They're invited in, they're allowed to stay for a specified period of time, and it really does represent an added increment for people to get back on their feet and re-enter society in a manner that's appropriate and respectful. <coughs> the matter that's before this committee today is the second phase of the development. In order to accommodate that additional space, the decision had to be made about where to put those additional 36 residents. And the decision was made to use some existing space at the back of the property behind the existing building for a one-story addition. And because of the location of that addition, it does trigger variances to the zoning bylaw. So we need variances with respect to the side yards, the building height, and the rear yard setback. And then essentially a recognition that there's gonna be no additional back to parking again. Um, there's no additional parking being provided. What's on the site today is being retained, that parking area at the front of the site, because this is a use, appreciate the nature of the resident, this is a use that doesn't create significant generation for car demand. So that recognition of the existing number of spaces works. It's effectively what's available to the existing use on James Street North. So that number and that variance in itself is appropriate because it, it, it reflects and represents the intensity of this use. <coughs> I think, Mr. Chairman, um, I would just maybe summarize my comments in that the, the second phase of development, again, it does require the minor variances. There is an active application to the city's planning department for site plan approval because this does constitute new development. Um, the city was to be issuing that conditional approval today because the, the staff, whether it be transportation, urban design, um, 
The raft of all the divisions that comment and collaborate on a site plan approval have reviewed it, and that conditional site plan approval is now in place, which to me um, provides validation to say that the development has been reviewed comprehensively and determined to be appropriate for this site. One of the key tests of, of, of Section 45.1, and in that it's been determined through that review process to be appropriate through that review process and further confirmation that really no adverse impacts do arise. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd be pleased to answer any questions that arise from committee or any of the submissions from the residents pr to provide any further clarity or justification. Um, I will point to the fact that we do have a staff report um, before you today as well that, that fully and completely en endorses and recommends approval of the variances before you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Citizens. I will call the uh, interested parties who have registered in order first. So we have uh, Alicia O'Connor. I believe they were intending to call in. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not currently see them. I will move on to the next person. We have uh, Laura Harrison is registered. If you could please come down to the lectern uh, to provide your comments. Thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity to speak to this item on the agenda. Um, I did submit a, a writing to voice my opposition to this uh, permit uh, originally, but um, so you should have it in your in your submission. Um, it was my understanding that uh, I that this was an increase in thirty bed thirty six bed capacity. Um, above the uh, 108 that was granted. Um, you can imagine my surprise when I saw in the application that it was for a 76 bed lodging home. Uh, and that's what's in your written documents. So I would ask, um, we need clarification and we need clarification from Mission Services and from Urban Core. Exactly how many people are you putting on this site? Um, you know, uh, my the colleague here makes it sound like a wonderful um, addition uh, and a move that's been uh, happened, but I think you'll hear from me and my other colleagues that we don't feel the same way. Um, so uh, I ask for a clarification, exactly how many beds are going to be on this site now and in the future. Um, I'd also like clarification uh, on the change of designation in beds. When the shelter, there was originally an approval for shelter beds and transitional beds on this site, and now all of a sudden this is changed to a lodging home. Uh, while I, stand, I understand that both are permitted under the zoning laws um, at this time, um, I, I'm just concerned that this change is, provides one less onus for mission services to provide the supportive services that they've promised that would be given to these, pay, pe these residents. Um, <coughs> that the focus for finding permanent housing for these people um, would become less of a, uh, a focus for mission services. They're in a lodging home, that's fine, they're good. Um, I'm not an expert on municipal laws or uh, running a city or anything like that. It's my understanding that a, that a lodging home requires um, a license per Hamilton um, laws and I don't know whether that has actually been granted and I'd like to have that clarification as well. Uh, with this change in designation, um, I request that this be denied um, and at, that the application for a lodging home be sent back to the Emergency and Communication Community Support Committee and the Housing and Homelessness Committee. Um, the original funding for this was based on shelter and transitional beds and this change to a lodging home should be reviewed. This would also provide and uh, allow for notification to the neighbors um, so that formal, complaint, formal comments and concerns could be heard. This whole endeavor has really caused significant concern and anxiety for our neighborhood. This could have been alleviated by an honest and open communication from both Urban Core and Mission Services. This facility was plunked down into our neighborhood with no consultation and no notice. 
the September 21st community engagement uh, meeting, um, which was really an announcement meeting. It was not asking for anything from residents other than letting us know what was happening in our community. Um, and uh, they could have used that opportunity to um, talk to us about um, this bed change, uh, talk to us about the change to, um, uh, to lodging homes and, and uh, sort of explain that, but that didn't take place at all. The owners and operators at this site and this committee seem to think that this application is a small matter that requires a few minor variances and setbacks in side yards and rear accesses. To the residents of this neighborhood, the introduction of another shelter and a lodging home into our area that's already over capacity for shelters, RFCs and supportive housing is a big deal. In summary, I ask that this application be denied until the requested clarifications are provided and until the redesignation of beds be reviewed by city staff and councillors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Jean Fair. If you could please proceed to the lectern to provide your comments. <coughs> Um, I actually brought some paperwork if you'd be interested in seeing it. Can, can I do that? Okay. Okay, back to these glasses. I could in the other. <laughs> okay. The application by Mission Services at 400 King Street East should never have been approved in the first place, and their put permit should be rescinded now. Um, on December 1st, 2022, after the delegation at City Hall against the Hats location in the Stipley neighborhood, Jason Thorne told the Chamber that he had recommended advanced consultation with that community. Mission Services uh, neighbours were likewise not informed until they were told that it was too late to take any action. The shovels were in the ground, Mission Services had $3 million in municipal funding, and the permits and license had been facilitated by the City. By bylaw number 05-200 stipulates that emergency shelter capacity shall not exceed 50 residents, yet Mission Services' own website states this location enables us to maintain 58 beds of fo housing-focused emergency uh, shelter. I forgot to say I too love uh, core urban stuff. It's just the use in a super dense um, area. Anyway. Uh, the community is already sat uh, saturated with social housing. In the city's own report, residential care facilities of 48 residential care facilities, 21 were in Ward 3. Um, the, there's also the radial separation distance of 300 meters. Um, within um, three, there's two pro facilities within 305 feet of Old Cathedral High School, another one 375 feet. Uh, away, not 300 meters, but uh, 305 feet, 375, and two of those facilities are within 177 feet of each other. Uh, Damazanad doors just a block away from this facility. They feed um, 500 people daily every day of the year. <coughs> and uh, the priest there, um, doc, uh, Father uh, Tony O'Dell, said that that number is actually approaching 600 people. And he said that people come from other shelters, even though they get three uh, meals there, because their food's better, it's not prepackaged. So they're afraid that the people from Mission Services will be dipping into the um, Damazna door as other shelters people do, and so it's a strain on their system. Um, and so the, uh, the um, radial separation bylaw hasn't been enforced by the city. <coughs> There's also the problem of the CTS sites. Um, again, the city has a map showing that 39.2% of the um, uh, opioid uh, paramedic call-ins are from Ward 2, and only 25.2% are from Ward 3, 15% less. And yet they're putting two CTS sites in <coughs> Ward 3, 1.6 meters apart. And that will, according to Lauren Gunter, and who is he? He's a um, past Canadian columnist and editorial board member with the National Post. He said, 
uh, where is it? Within 10 years of creating a consumption and treatment service, the population will have migrated to it. They bring crime and chaos. So we've got all this confluence of facilities in our neighbourhood. Uh, it's no wonder, too, that there's a housing program because so many of the regular homes are turning into social services. Uh, they've taken um, the larger buildings first, uh, uh, but they can have, they don't have to be just in one facility. They can have the same number of people that spread them out over three houses. So instead of going the, after the mansions, which they have so far, then they'll come down into fa smaller facilities um, based on the number of people in total. It's just, uh, I don't have, uh, I love uh, Corp and the work, we're always admiring it, but uh, uh, Old Cathedral High School, Good Shepherd, they're looking for $100 million right now for housing in, uh, at, uh, what is it, in the 300 block on Main East. Uh, they haven't told us what the po target population is, how many they intend to house there, but it's just too much from one neighborhood. We're sorry for these people, but they didn't consult with us at all or we would have responded a whole lot sooner. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Okay, thank you for your comments. Oh, I do have one rather rude one, but um, let's see. Uh, Terry Cook was quoted by Steve Buis, that's not rude. Uh, the concentration of poverty in subsidized housing in Hamilton's inner city is no accident. It's the result of te intentional public policy over generations particularly in suburban jurisdictions that spent time, energy, and official planning authority, precluding a range of housing options from locating in their neighborhoods. Jason Farr said, in a, a city shame to do with uh, 2013, eight uh, uh, teenagers that uh, uh, wanted to move to Corktown, uh, and they were denied, we need to spread, uh, originally, we need to spread these facilities across the city to ensure that we don't have an over-concentration and we have Brad Clark uh, speaking to radial separation at the December 1st uh, meeting. Uh, he wanted to strike it down, saying that he felt it was discriminatory. The H Ontario Human Rights Commissioner, Barbara Hall, did send letters to Hamilton City Council in 2013, warning them that they were violating Ontario's human rights code and the latter's ruling against eight teenage girls with mental illness. We hope the council will seek advice from their lawyers should they ever find themselves targeting a specific group of people again. But that's no reason to strike down radial separation. Sam Marula, defending the spirit of the radial separation policy, which is introduced in 2001, said, and this is the rude quote, but it's what he said, for anyone to suggest in any way that the bylaw was intended to discriminate, they'd have to have their head up there, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Ward 3 sees this bylaw as its sole protection from the further saturation of social housing projects in its ward. Uh, please maintain these and enforce these bylaws, admit the mistake in allowing mission services to proceed, and demand a halt to that project. There should be a moratorium on all social housing in Ward 3. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Carmen Orlandis. Please proceed to the lecture and to provide your comments. Chair, committee, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to express our stress and the hardships we have been experiencing in the area for the last two years. There is a culture of lack of transparency when it comes to these business deals, because at the end of the day, this is a business deal. We were told by mission services when we find out in our own what was going to happen in our neighborhood. Nobody told us before we found out that a core urban Inc. had found a dislocation which didn't need a zoning change <coughs> to create this a new shelter. And they approach mission services for a swap, or that's how it was told to us. Meaning 
the urban core had uh, secured a building in a less value neighborhood like ours and was trading with the intention, as we were told, to build the Lux apartments in the James Street North historical location of the shelter. Now, that is considered a private deal by the city. So we were told that we had no right to be informed beforehand. So in a way, we are the losing party in this. We are a missing piece of the puzzle on all these kind of deals. Because let's face it, the elephant in the room is a shelter of these dimensions has a huge impact upon the safety of the community. And that infringes a, right, a, right, a charter of right in chapter seven. How do we know this? Not just because we drove and walked by downtown or the shelters like mission services, like uh, uh, Good Shepherd, and see what's happening outside. No, we know this in our own flesh. Our neighborhood is low class, poor. Our apartment buildings are run down. We have the higher percentage of RCFs in the city. It is a rough neighborhood, but we love it. Two years ago, everything changed with the crisis, the opioid crisis, and uh, the, the COVID. Suddenly, uh, Good Shepherd uh, opened a temporary emergency shelter in Old Cathedral, which is just two blocks away from 400 King Street East. Since then, it has gone from one kind of temporary shelter to another one. So under that label, it remains. The problem is, during those, as soon as it was announced, the encampments moved out of downtown and Ferguson and came to our little neighborhood. We have witnessed their pain and their decline into death. I don't know if you have seen a person inhaling crystal meth. I have, and I have to be watching over them in front of my house every day. I had to deal with people going through psychotic episodes. Somehow, sometimes my words calm them down. Somehow, sometimes I need to call 911 and they refuse treatment because it's their right to do so. Sometimes there was a man that dead in the right of way in front of my house, and I had to call so many times, so many times for overdoses and for violent, violent violence right there. We didn't have those things before 2020, even if our neighbor was a poor neighbor, otherwise I could not afford to live there, right? So it's a poor neighbor and rough, but we manage the population. We talk to everybody. We know if somebody's abused in one of the RCFs. Now it has become too much. And you a plug in the same neighborhood, such a large shelter. We became used to call to Good Shepherd for assistance for the fights outside of the shelter. You have to consider that it's not only the clients in the shelter, it's the clients that they are banned from the shelter because unruly behaviors and they remain nearby. Right now, at this moment, there is a tent in the back of 400, not in their property, but right directly behind the back of 400 Green Street East. And today, there is two tents, one block away in Bishop Park, where last year there were four fires, one of them bringing down the wooden fence that's only a few feet away from a wooden structure um, 
RCF that house development, development handicap, very vulnerable people that will not be able to escape a fire. So it is not just the number of people that will be housed there. It's that high acuity presents a great hardship upon the community and our concentration is huge. Concentration of people is what should be looking to it. We, there is all this confusion, the stress that we have gone through trying to figure what happened. Like even now, there is this interim ownership when mission service declare to the emergency and community committee that they had ownership of the building since May 2022. All the questions we have asked are going unanswered. If I could interject, uh, just we need to keep our comments re in related to the variances that are in front of us and, and, and understand where you're coming from. And, and we do have, you know, a, a lot of applications uh, yet today to go through. And uh, I appreciate your concerns and, uh, and um, I, uh, I think we need to move on. That's all right. Thank you for letting me speak anyway. And what I say is the density in our area is not a gentle density. And this, and this addition, it will be not a minor variant. It will be a major impact and permanent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll hear from David Saab next. Please come down to the lectern to provide your comment. Pardon? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is uh, the last of the interested parties. If there are any other interested parties who are here to speak on this item, please make yourself known. No? Okay, uh, if the committee have any questions or whatever, maybe uh, the agent, if you wish to come back to the mic. Okay, committee. Okay, I'll go first. Okay, Nancy. Okay. Um, thank you to the uh, interested parties and to the neighbors. I'm also resident of Ward 3, and so I, I recognize some of and most of your concerns. Uh, there's also been another facility down on Cannon Street where the old taxi station was, and I'm probably a step away from that place. I understand these things happen, and we have to find a way to live with them, not against them. The variances we're looking at today are particularly um, isolated to, I think it's five, am I right, James? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of them was changed, if I read it correctly, regarding 15 parking spots instead of 10 for a required 25. And again, your um, demographic there are not car driving people. They may be staff more than anything, and I suspect that's where the 10 will be within the staff um, complement. Um, Everything else in these variances, I would guess I would consider them minor, and at the appropriate time, I would support um, a motion for approval. Okay, uh, Bob. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what a terrible time that we live in. We have housing shortages. We have people on the streets, we have drug problems, and this is our world. And uh, I agree with Nancy's comments. We aren't really in a position to do anything more than deal with the issues that are before us today. Whether this is the right location or whether the zoning's proper, that's the city to decide. And from what I understand from the uh, comments that uh, have come to us from the staff is that they have no concerns about this. And uh, from my perspective, when I do look at them, they are very minor. And uh, one of the difficulties that you have as a nonprofit organization dealing with people on the streets, and I've spent a number of years working with uh, Living Rock Ministries and youth on the streets, the only place to be located 
is in the downtown area like you are. And uh, it's very difficult to find the right type of facility. And I am really, really happy that these two individuals that are building this project for Mission Services, because they do do a great work. And Mission Services does a great work. And I think the only thing that we can hope from all of this is that if Mission Services is there, it's one more person that you can call on locally to have somebody come and deal with the issues that you're dealing with at your front doorstep. So I'm prepared to move uh, that we approve these variances. All right, is that a motion on the floor, yes. Bob? Okay, and was that motion um, as amended per zoning or was that just as written on the notice? Uh, what's the difference between amended by, what, what was the difference in that variance? Zoning asked for a change uh, being reflective of the further review of the site plan and they determined that there was a minimum of 15 spaces shall be permitted instead of the minimum 25 spaces required as opposed yeah. to in the notice it said a minimum of 10 spaces were to be permitted instead of the minimum 25 spaces required so they've yes added. okay thank you so as amended okay motion's been moved in a seconder Nancy, all in favor? You're here. Opposed? Seeing none, Mr. Chair. Seeing none opposed. Motion's carried, application is approved. Thank you very much. And thank you for the added time that you put forward to this creative issue. Okay, Nancy is, okay. Thank you for your comments, Nancy. All right, and we're all set for the next item. We are now hearing HMA 22360 for 922 Main Street East in Hamilton. We have the agent registered to speak and no other interested parties. Okay, is the agent available? Yes, I am. Yes, did you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? Uh, yes, I did. And uh, I don't have any problems with them. Okay. Committee have any questions? David? Move it, please. David, move. Second. Second. By Melvin? Okay. All in favor? Here, here. Opposed? Seeing none. Seeing none. Motion carried. Application approved. Great. Thank you. And we're all set for the next file. We're hearing HMB 22119 and HMA 22. 357 for 47 Ontario Avenue in Hamilton. We have the agent registered to speak and two interested parties. Okay, is the agent available? Uh, yes, yeah, speaking, Ken Beacondam from King Homes, Inc. Yes, did you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? Uh, yes, I did, yep. And do you have any questions? Uh, no, pretty straightforward comments. I did work closely with staff to um, you know, to finalize the application. Um, and I agree with staff, uh, you know, they're supporting this application. Fairly routine uh, infill lot. Uh, it's a double wide lot. Um, and we're gonna be severing it and putting a single detached home on it. Okay, so, thank you. And we have uh, interested parties. So we have Anna and Latano, oh, sorry, Anna Latano and Ian Kimberly registered to speak. Yeah, uh, this is Ian here. Um, yeah, the, I live right directly behind 49. And um, I, I just, it took me forever to open up this document, sorry. But the uh, it, uh, the one thing about the, uh, that I, can I just ask a question just about the, um, about the variances? It's not the pr approval to, this doesn't, con give approval to build the building. This is just for severing the lots, right? Uh, yes, and there are some parking uh, variances as well. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the variances before the committee deal with uh, the proposed lo new lot as well as um, proposed dwelling. 
Okay. Um, so the the new the 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 variance doesn't give very many details about the new dwelling, though. Um, there's a lot of blanks here, like insufficient information, insufficient information. And why is that? Well, there probably are no no information on the dwellings themselves um, until um, they require a building permit or a plan for uh, whatever structure is going on those lots. So right now it's just um, the severance of the lots. Is that right uh, to the agent? Oh, sorry, I cut out there. Um, what was the question? So I think the question is, uh, is concerns and whatever as to what is going to be built there. Yeah, there's insufficient information. There's no information. Like, how can you approve a variance when you don't even know it's going to go on there? Jesus Christ. Ken, we can't hear you. Yeah. Like, I... I oh, yeah, Sorry. Man. Sorry, guys. Um, so... We've applied for the severance and for the site plan um, to build a single family home. Um, we haven't proceeded with architectural drawings yet because, you know, we want to have the approval first from committee to go ahead with that. This is, um, you know, it's going to be an infill house. You know, we're going to design it so that it blends in with the neighborhood there. Um, but uh, all the variances we need to build are, are just what's before committee this evening. Yeah. Um, so, like the first, the first, the the variance, the severing of the property, absolutely. Should, you know, that's totally within your rights. I guess the the lack of detail though on the structure, um, and being you know granted a site plan without actually knowing what's going to go there. Uh, is it is it apartments or a single family home? The pr the proposal is for a single uh, family dwelling. Okay. So uh, that's that's my comments there. Committee, you know, the first one with to sever it, that's good. The sec second one, there's lack of detail. Okay, okay thank, thank you for your comments. Is there any other? No. No, sorry, Mr. Chair, that's, uh, okay. those were the only Committee, any questions, questions on this application? Motion? Margaret? Yep. Um, motion to approve okay. both motion. applications. Both applications. Seconder? David, all in favor? Here, here. Opposed? Seeing none. Seeing none. Motion carried. Application approved. All right. Thank you. All right. And we're all set for the next file. We're hearing HMA 22341 for 207 Grenfell Street in Hamilton. We have the owner registered to speak and no other interested parties. Jamila, what's our uh, quorum? Um, David would like to leave. I just didn't know whether, do we drop below? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I got a waiting room for the clients, so hopefully we're quick or I have to go. <laughs> Okay, so our, our quorum is uh, four members. Four? Yeah. So we're good? Okay, David, if you... Uh, hello, is it, I'm for 207 Grenfell. Is it okay if I had my agent speak on my behalf? It's Michael uh, uh, Bar. He's uh, on the web website there. So we're on the... Okay. Yeah, so... Grenfell Street? That's correct, yeah, yeah, 207 Grenfield, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, so the agent, you have an agent that's available? Yes, I do. Okay, and has the agent had the, is he there present? <laughs> yes, Good evening, yes. Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm here. My name is Michael okay. Shazakbar. Do you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? We have, yes. And do you have any questions on them? No, we have no uh, concerns with the comments uh, from planning and development engineering. Uh, I just want to confirm that committee, when making the decisions, uh, it's variance number three and four with regards to setback is also being considered as well, which are existing non-conforming conditions. So this was a construction started without permits, is that right? That is correct. So when uh, the, 
this happened, the the homeowner was misinformed on what was allowed. Uh, basically, it was uh, a contractor who misled the con the homeowner on what they're allowed to do, and they basically built this structure not knowing that they actually have to go for permit approval. Hence, now why we're before you asking for bylaw relief for the variances before you, but granted, the variances that we are asking, uh, two are quite minor in nature, and another two are actually existing non-conforming condition. And I'll be more than happy to address any concerns or comments the committee may have. Okay. I know when you apply for the building permit that there will be a, a rise in or the, an increase in the fee because of the construction started before a permit was issued. Um, does the committee have any questions on the variances that are in front of us? Tom? Seems to me a, a couple there suggested that, do we, do we consider those as well? I mean, we started out with uh, two variances being asked for, and then there, now under zoning, there's three others being suggested. Through you, Mr. Chair, if I can clarify what's happened here. So when we actually applied for the building permit, it was that these variances did exist. When we applied for the committee of adjustment, uh, the zoning examiner, for some reason, had missed these variances, and I brought it to their attention afterwards, and hence why zoning has added this information so that committee, when making their decision, uh, accounts for the existing nonconforming conditions that weren't, uh, were kind of missed by the zoning examiner afterwards. Yeah, they're existing conditions, so I'm fine with it. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I believe I have I'll move it. Okay. Mel moved. Okay. Seconded, seconded as amended. By Mark. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Motion carried, application approved. Thank you. And for the next, uh, sorry, for the record, HMA 22343 for 205 Glenholm Avenue in Hamilton was uh, withdrawn. Uh, our next item is HMA 22382 for 4 Vickers Road in Hamilton. We have the agents registered to speak, um, and I believe we have staff wishing to speak as well, Mr. Chair. Okay. Is the agent available? I'm here. Did you have a chance to read the comments that were posted? I have. And I have no issues with the uh, the staff report or the comments. I can uh, have a presentation if you'd like. Otherwise, I'm happy just to answer any questions. Uh, staff wishes to speak. Through the chair, Shannon Mackay. Um, I just wanted to clarify that through the uh, review of the minor variance, there was an additional variance noted. Mike, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. It's with regard to the uh, finished floor level of the garage associated with the street townhouses. Uh, this is an oversight as a result of recent changes to the bylaw. So it wasn't as a result of the initial application by the applicant, but it is a, um, a variance that is necessary to uh, uh, have regard for the exist or the the proposed street townhouses, and so a modification would be to add a minor variance to state that the garage floor level for a street townhouse dwelling shall not be required to be a minimum of 0 0.3 meters above grade. Again, this isn't related to the actual development proposal. It's a, a variance associated with one of the recent uh, city initiated zoning bylaw amendments, and just had the effect of. Uh, making the proposal non-conforming. So, Mike, you're okay with that? Uh, yes, to the chair, uh, not, not an issue with that. Uh, I did actually approach staff uh, with questions on that, and uh, so thank you, uh, uh, staff, uh, for the answer today. So no issues with us uh, on that. Okay. Can I make a motion to approve with the amendment? I'll okay. second. Motion made by Mark, seconded by Bob. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Seeing none. Motion carried. Application approved. Thank you. Have a good evening. 
Is that the last hearing? Okay, guys, I've got to fly, so I want to wish a Merry Christmas, everyone, but I don't know if that's perfectly yes. correct anymore, so happy holidays, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Okay, bye. Yes, same to you. Same yeah. to you, Mark. Bye. Can I have a motion <laughs> to adjourn the meeting today? Margaret? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Meeting is adjourned.